Welcome to episode 65 of the Talking Friars podcast. Ben Fadden here. Uh, today, after the Padres lost to the Giants 11 to 4, um, not a whole lot to say about, you know, this Giants series. Well, I'll recap it for you, you know, give a little bit of reaction, but this is kind of more just, you know, an end of season episode. I'm recording now as probably Jace Tingler's going to be meeting with the media. So if he ever said, if he says anything, you know, as of that's noteworthy, I'll definitely, you know, be mentioning that. Um, but, you know, Obviously, the good news coming out of this for the Padres is that the Dodgers will not be winning the division, and so they have to play a one-game playoff now uh, starting on Tuesday or Wednesday, excuse me, against the Cardinals. That's the good news. Uh, obviously, being a Padre fan, you don't want the Dodgers to you know, win the, their ninth straight division, and that won't happen now. The Giants win it. Props to them with you know, 107 wins, I think. Uh, no one was expecting that to happen at the beginning of the season, but it it happened. Uh, they have a lot of veteran players on that team. Brandon Belt had a career year. Uh, Brandon Crawford as well. He earned an extension. Posey played well. Uh, and then they got some pretty significant con- contributions from guys that they probably weren't expecting, um, you know, such as Logan Webb today, who hit a home run and then he shut down the Padres offense. So props to the Giants. And the good news coming out of this is we get to see Dodger fans quaking in their boots in a one game playoff against arguably the hottest team in the league and the Cardinals. So we'll see how that shakes out. Um, but as for the series Friday, the Padres lose three, nothing to the giants. Um, again, it, it, the giants had opportunities um, to clinch the division and they just couldn't do it um, until Sunday when they won. Uh, because the Dodgers kept winning. So I guess props to them too. But, um, you know, the Dodgers, they ended up just being that game back. And that's what that's what hurt them, obviously. You know, they play 162 games and it comes down to that. Um, but again, Padres, they lose Friday night's game three to nothing. Pedro Avila started the game, gave up two runs in the first inning. He didn't even really pitch that bad. Um, but, I mean, it's just kind of, it, it's kind of disappointing and embarrassing that you have Pedro Avila uh, pitching, you know, games, you know, starting games at the end of the season, just because guys, they're pretty much their whole rotation is hurt. So that that's a little disappointing. Um, but you no, know, Pedro Avila, you know, he made a spot start a couple years ago for the Padres. He pitched well. Those two runs was all he gave up. Uh, Lamonte Wade Jr. would have a sack fly. Emilio Pagan had a bounce back outing. So he's going to end on a pretty good note, a one, two, three inning in the eighth. Uh, Fernando Tatis Jr. became the 11th player in MLB history to record 40 homers, 30 doubles, and 25 stolen bases in a season. He's the youngest player ever in Major League Baseball to do so. Um, So just another thing that you could put on his resume, hopefully, that goes to his, that's, you know, attributes towards his 2021 National League MVP award. Hopefully, because that's really all the Padres were playing for. Um, you know, they obviously weren't making the playoffs. Uh, probably the coaching staff is done. They're just those decisions. I think were already made. And so, what all Padre fans really cared about was just seeing if they could, you know, help the Giant lose, and then with the Giants, you know, so the Giants could win the division instead of the Dodgers. And then obviously with the Tatis MVP, that's what Padre fans were, you know watching for you know when these games didn't matter in terms of the Padres making the playoffs or not because they were already out so they lose Friday night uh, Saturday they ended up winning uh, but before the game John Hammond John Hammond tweeted that Jace Tingler would be relieved of his duties um, not surprising I wrote a piece up on Gaslamp Ball just a quick breaking news piece about it and then minutes later the Padres came out and said that John Hammond's tweet was premature and that Jace is going to be managing uh, the rest of the weekend. Um, so with when Heyman, Heyman's usually not wrong, and Rosenthal's usually not wrong. Rosenthal was wrong with the Scherzer trade, but I don't expect this to be wrong. We, we were all expecting Tingler to be gone, and the coaching staff for that matter, pretty much. So I, I, I think that while the report might, be, might have been premature then, you know, because he wasn't actually fired, he was effectively gone effectively fired, um, you know, at the time of that tweet that that went out. I mean, if if Tingler stays, 
I think Preller needs to be fired. Uh, that's, I mean, it, that's how obvious it is. When he's lost the clubhouse, when no one, it doesn't feel like anyone wants him to be the manager. Um, they want an experienced manager who commands the respect of the veterans on the team and the Fernando Tatis juniors of the team and guys like that. Um, Tingler should not be the manager anymore. Uh, that's that. Uh, but as for the game, Musgrove got to 200 strikeouts, first Padre to do so since 2015 when James Shields and Tyson Ross did it. Uh, Musgrove, his final line for Saturday night was five innings, one run, three hits, four strikeouts, no walks. That's a great outing to finish the year at, you know, solid start. No walks. You always love to see that. You're not, not giving any free passes away. And I wrote a quick, you can look at it on gaslampball.com. Um, I just wrote a quick thank you note, you know, to Joe Musgrove and to Preller. I know Preller's getting some heat now because of, you know, the moves that he didn't make at the deadline and some of the moves he did make and his, you know, hiring of Tingler now looks really bad, but I did want to thank him, you know, for acquiring Musgrove. This is, is going to go down as his second best trade that he's ever made as general manager of the Padres behind Fernando. Um, he comes over here and he gives Padre fans like myself so much joy. I obviously haven't didn't experience the two World Series appearances in 84 and 98. And Musgrove throwing that no-hitter was like the it was the bet the closest feeling, at least I would think, to you know, winning an NL pennant or winning a World Series. Obviously, that hasn't happened yet, but that that feeling because it was it's one of those things that you didn't think was ever going to happen like when Matt Kemp hit for the cycle I, I remember I wasn't even really watching that game against the Rockies uh but you know this game there was so much expectation going into the year and at that point obviously so early in the season they were living up to it so everyone had their eyes glued to the tv regardless if it must was going to throw it or not but it made it that much more special that he was able to do it when I think more Padre fans are watching than they would have if, um, you know, a Tyson Ross or an Andrew Kashner did it just because the team wasn't as good back then. Um, so I just wanted to thank, you know, Preller for making that trade. And he's, and he pitched great this year. Musgrove is the only guy that didn't stay healthy or that didn't get hurt. Um, you know, and then Don Orsillo for the call, you know, Friar Faithful and going to into a frenzy is something I'm always going to remember. You know, I kept score of that game and just I, it was like the fifth inning of that no hitter and I didn't move. I was I said I was I was going to go eat dinner and I didn't move from the couch, keeping score that same spot. I was not going to get up, even if I had to go to the bathroom. I wasn't leaving that spot until that no hitter was finished. And when it was finished, it was like the best feeling in the world. So, again, thank you to AJ for making that move. Thank you to Don for, you know, making us feel like we were all there, even though he and Mud were in San Diego. Pro uh, I wasn't listening to the radio, so I can't speak to Jesse and Tony's calls, but um, I saw it after and their reactions were great. Um, but just all around, that was just one of the, that was easily the best moment of the season. Uh, but let's just get back to this game. Um, Musgrove again, he had a solid five inning start, finishes the year 3.18 earned run average. 203 strikeouts, 181 in a third innings. Best starter of the Potters this year, no doubt. Most consistent. Um, Cronenworth did drive in the go-ahead RBI double in this game to give the Potters the win, 3-2. to two, And that left the door open for the Dodgers to possibly win the division today, recording on Sunday, if they won on Saturday, which they did. And then if they won on Sunday and the Giants lost Sunday, that obviously didn't happen. Dodgers beat the Brewers here today, but the Giants obviously blow out the Padres 11 to four. It was done pretty early. Posey had a two RBI double. The left center made it two nothing. Um, Lamette RB, allowed an RBI single to Lestelle in the fourth, made it three to one Giants. Wilmer Flores had a two RBI double. That made it five one. Wade sack fly. Monte Wade Jr. sack fly made it 6-1. Posey single up the middle made it 7-1. Logan Webb pitched trem tremendous, shut down the Padres offense, essentially. Um, I talked, you know, I mentioned him at the beginning. You know, he was some of those, he was one of those guys where it's like, uh, what are we going to expect? You know, the casual fan that doesn't follow the Giants every day. And he performed, and not only that, he hit a home run. He helped himself. He hit a two-run home run off Nabil Chris Matt in the fifth. 
That made it nine to one. The game was obviously over. Tatis exited in the bottom of the six because it was a blowout. He finished the season hitting 283, 365 on base, 612 uh, OPS or slugging percentage, excuse me, despite missing 30 games in the season. He had 25 stolen bases, like I mentioned earlier. Uh, I think he should win the MVP. Uh, you know, Juan Soto and Bryce Harper may have had a strong case when, you know, especially Harper, if the Phillies had made the playoffs or were even fighting for a playoff spot in the last three games of the season, but they weren't. They just got swept. He went like 0 for 11 in that Brave series, their biggest series of the year, and that's not what an MVP does. Um, I think Tatis, I think another thing that people don't talk about is, you know, his willingness to move positions to help the team win. And when you're talking about valuable, he could have just said, no, I'm staying at shortstop. Um, you know, he could have elected for the shoulder surgery and, you know, just stopped, ended the year, but he didn't. Uh, I don't, he doesn't even want the shoulder surgery though. So I guess that point doesn't really make sense, but he still didn't opt for that. You know, switching to the outfield when he never played it before, then switching back you know, just in whatever situation the team is going to put them in so that the Padres could have the best chance of winning. I think that's, you know, when you talk about most valuable, there you go. Um, again, led the league in home runs, first Padre National League home run king, uh, Tatis at 42 this year, first NL home run king for the Padres since Fred McGriff in 1992. He finishes second on the all-time Padres single season home run list uh, behind Greg Vaughn with when he hit 50 home runs in a season, uh, just a great year overall. Machado is another guy. He exited at the top of the seventh. He hit 278 on the year, 28 home runs, 106 RBIs. Um, he's another, I mean, he's the captain of the team. Fernando said that earlier this year. I think everyone agrees that he's the captain of the team. And um, I, I can't, it, it's hard to express how valuable he is to the Padres. You know, he's probably not going to win an MVP with the Padres, but he was putting up MVP numbers. Um, but he's just, he's one of those guys that it seems like people only talk about him when he's doing something that might be perceived as negative to the, you know, the regular baseball world. But those people don't watch Manny play on a daily basis. And, you know, when you watch him like me and you watch like Padre fans, you watch them play on a, on a daily basis. You watch Manny play. You totally, you know, gain respect for him and you realize how valuable he is to the team. You know, he doesn't like sitting out. You know, he went like after, you know, as a team, even when the team was struggling and look, their playoff hopes were going away, he didn't take an off day for months and months and months because he knew an 80% Manny Machado is better than a full 100% Ha Sung Kim. No disrespect to him, but that's just the way it was. And he wants to be there. He wants to suit up for the team. And while some members of the media might not like Manny's responses, you know, whenever he does speak to the media, you know, when they're asking him about, you know, different things, you know, they're asking him about what went wrong this year, and his only responses are, we just didn't win enough games. We got to win more games. We got to come back next year and win more games. That's who he is. He's just a winning mindset. He doesn't care what the media thinks. He 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 truly just wants to win ball games. And so I I really, really hope that um, you know, if people around the game can, you know, start to appreciate this guy more and not just try to just you know, make this narrative about all this negative stuff, you know, that happens or any slide that he makes and you want it, that's the only time that he's in the news. He's just a good all around baseball player. So Manny and Tatis, they end their seasons on a pretty strong note. Uh, Hosmer struck out fittingly as the final out of this game. Giants won 11 to four. Uh, Padres finished 79 and 83 on the year, four games under 500. Again, that allowed the Giants to win the National League West, which I'm happy about, which every Padre fan should be happy about because the two options were the Giants and the Dodgers. Who would you rather see win the National League West? Who would you rather see? I'd rather see the Giants. I'm tired of the Dodgers winning the West. You know, going into the year, I was like, the Dodgers aren't winning the West. The Padres are. Um, we got that correction, you know, that prediction right, you know, half. 
we got it 50 percent right you know the Dodgers didn't win the division but the Giants did and the Padres fell flat in their faces in the second half um obviously said it multiple times I, I think we'll have some separate episodes diving into this full season you know with some beat writers and some guests on to you know totally break down the season so I'm not gonna you know give you like full thoughts for a half an hour or whatnot I think that's better for another episode uh but with that said it's a disappointing year um you know the expectations I don't care that there were injuries you should not finish under 500 when you had projected to have the best rotation in baseball going into the year by from fan graphs um Blake Snell you know didn't perform up to expectations till the last couple months of the season and then unfortunately gets hurt Chris Paddock had an up and down year Ryan Weathers Gave up 28 runs in a, like a five appearance span, which really, really did not help. I get he played really pitch well early on against the Dodgers, but he did not pitch well. Uh, Lamette, we're in the same situation as we were last year, kind of uncertain about his status in a Padre uniform, what his role is going to be because he gets hurt during the year as a starter, comes in in relief, and he didn't pitch that great out of relief. And he might be a DFA you know, nominee because there's just too many options and you just don't know about his health. You might be able to just save some money, uh, you know, and just DFA him. That might be unfortunate, but that might be something that happens. Um, Tingler quotes are coming out right now, so I, we can end the episodes with that. Um, so let's get to the Tingler quotes. But again, it was a disappointing year. Uh, Tingler speaking to the media now, and there's tweets coming out. Um, Chase Tingler on if he deserves to return as manager. Quote from Marty Caswell, Tingler says, I do, I believe in this group. Of course I wanna be a part going forward. I think we're going to, we're closer to getting up top of the division than going the other way. We have a lot of talent, a lot of winning players. That would be an absolute yes, in terms of if he thinks he deserves to return. Obviously, I don't believe that. I don't think anyone believes that. I don't think Tingler really believes that. I'm sorry. How do you believe? How can you believe in your real down in your deep heart? How can you totally believe that you believe or that you think that you deserve to be the Padres manager when a team that was supposed to be in route to the NLCS to the World Series going into the season and they finish four games under 500? There's reports in the middle of the season about, you know, right in the pennant race about you losing the clubhouse and about players not wanting to play for you. I'm sorry. How can you realistically believe that you deserve to be the manager? That was the question. Not if you want to be the manager. Of course, everyone, I want to be the manager. Anyone wants to be the manager. But do you deserve to be the manager? Jace Tingler does not deserve to be the manager of this baseball team. Not when you underperform that vastly, not when you don't control a locker room, you know, that's, you just don't deserve to be the manager. It's as simple as that. Um, so I think, yeah, that, I mean, that's, that's a mind boggling quote that Tingler said. Um, yeah, he does not deserve to be the manager. Uh, Jace Tingler in his final media session, Kevin Acey tweets out, uh, Tingler expects to talk with A.J. Preller in the next couple of days. That's probably going to be uh, Preller firing Tingler. I know that the only, I mean, with Preller in the position, it's kind of, that's the one question, right? Will he fire his buddy? You know, will he fire a guy uh, two seasons after he hired him and say, you know, as recently as, you know, what, like a month ago before a game at Petco, he said he wants Tingler to manage his team for the next 10 years. Will he be? Will he have the guts to fire him? It's the obvious decision. You know, I've said it m multiple times now. When you lose the clubhouse, when this team that has this much talent, you know, has a losing record at the end of the year and is over 20 games back in the division of the Dodgers and Giants, you don't deserve to be the manager. But will Will Preller do it? I think if he doesn't do it, I think he's going to lose his job because I think Peter Scyther knows that Tingler should not be the manager of his team. So. Um, in the real world, uh, Tingler said, in the real world, not everybody likes their boss. That said, these guys played their ASS off. 
I will not stop defending them. I will not stop caring. That's good and all for you, Jace, to say that you're not going to stop caring and you're not going to stop defending the team. Um, and in the real world, and he he admits that not everyone likes him when he says in the real world, not everybody likes their boss. So, uh, yeah, that, that admits that not everyone liked him and that admits that backs up AC's reporting and Ken Rosenthal and Dennis Lynn's reporting that he lost the clubhouse and that people don't want to play for him. He obviously knows that, you know, with that quote saying that not everybody likes their boss. Um, yeah, but in the manager position, when your player, the guys that are playing like on the field don't like you, I think that's a problem because they're not going to buy into your messaging when the team's losing, which obviously that occurred. The team was losing and they obviously just weren't buying into the message of the, of the manager. And why was that? Because the manager, the players probably thought that the manager was an extension of the front office, a yes man, a buddy to Preller. And when Preller tried to trade a clubhouse favorite, that rubbed players the wrong way, right or wrong. And when Preller decided not to go upgrade the starting rotation, that probably rubbed players the wrong way, saying that this guy's not trying to win. And if Tingler's view is an extension to Preller in the front office, Okay, well, then maybe Tingler isn't all in on winning. I'm not saying that. It, I know Tingler is all in on winning, but that might be per, that might be what is perceived, you know, when Jace is figured as a yes man to AJ in the front office. So, no, Tingler does not deserve to be back. You could say all the one that you, of course, he's going to say that he deserves to be back, but he doesn't. I know deep inside, he probably doesn't think he deserves to be back. Uh, not when you underperform that much, not when players don't want to play for you anymore. It would be one thing if it's the front office and they're just making moves, you know, roster wise. But when you're in the clubhouse every day, when you're communicating with these players every day and they're not buying into your message, that's a problem. So I guess we'll end the episode with that again this week. We'll probably hopefully we have the Tingler manager firing news again. I'm not I don't like calling for anyone's jobs. Uh, but it's clear to every Padre fan that Tingler needs to go. It's unfortunate that the injuries happened, but this team, even with the injuries, they should not have finished under 500. It's as simple as that. There were too many series where they got swept by the Rockies. There were too many series where they, you know, went or road trips rather when you go one in five and you get no hit by Tyler Gilbert, who was a mechanic a year earlier. There was too many series like that. That, you know, getting swept by the Dodgers the last three series that they face them. There's just too, too many of those series that even with injuries, you just didn't play well enough. You didn't motivate the guys good enough. They didn't buy into your messaging. You just don't deserve to be back. So that's that's the main thing you take away uh, from this episode is there, I, I don't I can't think of reasoning to bring Tingler back. Um, so. Again, that's the end of this episode. This has been episode 65 this week. Hopefully we'll have the Tingler firing news uh, just to, you know, get this offseason going. Um, hopefully they can bring in an experienced manager. I'm hoping to talk to some guests this week as well to give their thoughts and any more inside info that they have on the pottery season and uh, moves that might be made. Uh, you can, you know, tune into gaslampball.com for I'm going to be doing some postseason uh, you know, evaluations of players and just takeaways from each player's seasons. Uh, and obviously we'll come to you if we have any news, any opinion stuff, any reaction to anything that happens. Uh, so thank you everyone for staying with us for with the Talking Friars podcast. I hope that you've enjoyed, you know, my opinion, Jacob's opinion, our, our analysis, our reactions from the games. It sucks that this is the last season episode, but we'll definitely be coming to you in the off season. Um, you know, it sucks that you have to call for a guy's job in, in Jace Tingler. Um, but that's just the way it is because they just didn't perform well enough. So we'll talk to you later. Uh, until next time, let's go Padres. This has been episode 65 of the Talking Ferris podcast. Ben, Fa ben Fenn signing off. Uh, see ya.